You're listening to Natural Resources University. This episode features Timber University, hosted by Dr. Brady Self and Dr. Sean Tanger. Welcome to the Timber University podcast, brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Forestry and the University of Arkansas at Monticello's Forest Business Center. I'm Sean Tanger. And I'm Brady Self. We're both forestry specialists covering topics from soils to silviculture to social sciences as they pertain to forest stewardship. In this podcast, we'll extend research findings and professional experiences that are relevant to forest landowners, consultants, loggers, and other natural resource professionals. If you fall into one of those categories, we'll help you explore historical and current science that you can apply to your practical forestry knowledge and experiences. All right, well, welcome back to uh, Timber University. Uh, Today's episode is going to focus on uh, timber uh, casualty. Uh, As you'll remember, last time when I spoke on taxes, I said that there were six major areas that you as a forest landowner needed to be aware of in terms of uh, uh, special situations for uh, timber in terms of reforestation, uh, uh, tax incentives, um, uh, as well as uh, some of your some of your uh, uh, capital gains treatments uh, for for timber sales and things like that. And most of those are areas where you as a forest landowner are, are really advantaged compared to uh, your your more typical ag based businesses and things like that. They're uh, they're specific to timber and, and they're and they're quite valuable in terms of keeping keeping your costs low and uh, get, getting those those returns uh, to be to be as, as well balanced as they possibly can. Today's topic, however, there's not a lot of good news. Um, <laughs> it's sort of as Steve, as Dr. Steve Dickey would say, the guy who really helped, helped train me in, in timber taxation would say, it's the best of the worst decisions that you can make. That just sounds like a normal economist yeah. answer to me. Well, I, I took to it like a duck in water, certainly. <laughs> uh, uh, Steve's not an economist, but y- you wouldn't know it by talking to him. He's, he's quite good and in, in running those financials and things. But uh, yeah, the, these are the hardest questions I, I deal with uh, in my outreach and my former extension appointments um, because I don't have a lot of good stuff to tell landowners and uh, it's just, it's not fun to give people bad news. Uh, that said, there are some things that you can do to ameliorate the, the, the problem, kind of a, a tourniquet, so to speak, on, 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 the, on the wound. And so we'll, we'll go through that uh, today and then uh, in a future episode, maybe with Dr. Steve Dickey, hopefully, uh, we'll talk about uh, salvage options that you might have uh, when, when a casualty event occurs. And, and just to, you know, if you don't know what a casualty is, when I'm talking about salvage and those sorts of things, when we talk about a, a casualty loss, the IRS's definition of a casualty loss is damage, destruction, or loss of timber resulting from identifiable event that is sudden, be it swift, not gradual, or progressive. You can tell this is IRS language, right? Unexpected, so an unintended or unanticipated uh, event, or unusual, uh, not something that happens routinely. If we're going to do forest management, these are events that you wouldn't factor these events into your forest management planning, things like uh, your what you mentioned in some of the past episodes with just your typical mortality that you get yeah. after first year and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you know, examples of this would be a fire, a hurricane, tornado, ice storms are, are pretty common, uh, earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions. So, Mount St. Helens is a famous case with uh, Weyerhaeuser, uh, uh, you know, back back in the day, and uh, auto crashes. If somebody crashes into your trees. Or in special cases, if you were to have things like a uh, pine beetle outbreak for, you know, this has happened in the South, the South before where you could have a swarm, you know, hit a stand and instead of it taking months to, uh, to really knock that stand out, could do it, you know, in, in a couple of weeks. It doesn't, sure. doesn't happen often, but it, there is precedence for it in the, the IRS, uh, you know, tax litigation that's out there. Sure. Sure. So that said, I kind of already uh, buried the lead there. That's what a casualty is. What isn't a casualty? Or what would the IRS not consider losses in your timber stand as being casualty losses and therefore you know, uh, 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 qualifying for some of these nice tax treatments? Nice being the kind of a loaded word. Well, normal timber losses, like I said, any expected mortality, uh, insect and disease infestations that aren't 
uh, really abnormal uh, drought, so low rainfall, uh, uh, crowding. Uh, if somebody didn't plant your trees correctly, the IRS is not in the business to help you out with those those situations. Now, of course, there's t tax advantages for you know doing reforestation things like that. If you do have a failure, um, but you know those that'd be another another issue. Um, there's also what we call non-casualty timber losses. So these are also the result of unusual and unexpected, but not sudden events. So you could have severe drought. Uh, this has happened. We're in Nacogdoches, Texas, uh, uh, doing uh, doing these episodes, and uh, I believe it was 2016, 2017. They had about an 18 month drought. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a stitch of rain, and had massive losses across landscape wide. Uh, uh, timber, but it took 18 months. Question question on that, actually, how do you, and, I, and I'm thinking about this from a yard tree standpoint, granted, you're, you're, you're talking above that, you're talking at a scale from a uh, you know, commercial forestry standpoint, how do you address that? Because it's not a finite moment where, where you, yep, drought did this or no drought didn't. You know, with yard trees, you, you may have five years, you know, four, three, four, five years before you see that mortality actually come on and, and your tree die. And it was linked back to you know, root death or something like that sure. at that moment in time, well, that period of time where the tree was under drought. How do you, how do you account that in the, for that in the casualty loss world? For that, there would be none. Okay. Um, think of it this way. The best way to know if it's a casualty event is if there is good documentation, either through the, the, the news, uh, through disaster preparedness agencies and things like that, where there's a defined start of the event and there's a defined end and they're not very far apart. Yeah. So a hurricane's the most natural one, yeah. right? I could pick up the newspaper and, hey, uh, Hurricane Ivan is going to land two days from now. And then, you know, two, a week later, there's an article showing all the damage. And, you know, I don't know, man. M Mount St. Helens, that's, that was pretty... That's pretty notable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Warehouser uh, uh, actually helped out uh, small landowners, incidentally, uh, when they went to court over that, and we'll we'll talk about uh, where where they've where they've actually helped uh, other landowners uh, by going to court over how they define what their uh, you know what land can we can we add into the overall damage assessment that we're doing. Sure. So just some general rules, um, to, but, you know, to, to answer your point, unfortunately, if, if you do have a yard tree that dies from a drought over that time period, it's, it's, uh, you, 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 you pretty much out of luck. Yeah. Okay. You're not yeah. going to get anything off a of casualty. Um, general rules for casualty are deductions are available to owners with a profit motive. Um, that's not to say that there's not some help, uh, in, in terms of, uh, federally, uh, uh, declared disasters or presidentially declared disasters. We'll talk about that for the hobby farmer, ho hobby forester, or the uh, personal uh, landowner. Um, I use those terms interchangeably. They're not always, of course. Uh, deductions are limited to the lesser of the timber's decrease in fair market value. So you would have to assess that property. What you know, If you didn't have it assessed before the storm and now you're assessing it after, uh, a consultant or, or some specialist is going to have to make evaluation of what the fair market value was prior to the, the damage happening. And then they're going to take the difference between those two numbers um, or the adjusted basis, whichever of those two is smaller. Now, basis we talked about a little bit last time, but remember, whenever you buy or inherit um, you know, a timber stand or a timber property, uh, there's going to be different calculations for you determining how much of that, that, that uh, money that you've spent or uh, from the property that you've inherited should go into the trees or should go into the land or should go into buildings, etc. But each one of those will then have a basis account, which as you deplete um, any of those assets, so for land when you sell it, trees as you cut them, you would then remove some of that basis during your sales. And that would, that would lower your overall tax hit uh, whenever you had a, a timber set, which is a good thing. The problem is, as you do that, you burn that basis up. And so if you're really aggressive with deducting your basis on timber sales and you do a, a heavy amount for a thin end and a heavy amount for a second thin, well, guess what? When yeah. you get to your crop trees, you don't have anything left. You don't have anything left. 
And that's bad in a sale <coughs> because you can't knock it off of your oversell price and you got a huge crop. Uh, so the value should be pretty good. Likewise, if those trees are really old and a storm hits them and you're not insured, then you're in a lot of trouble because you don't have any basis. Mm -hmm. And so there might be a huge fair market loss, fair market value loss, but you have no basis. According to the IRS, if you don't have basis in your timber, then they don't care what happens to your property. Hurricane wipe it all out. You don't have a casualty event from, from the IRS's perspective. Um, and lastly, as far as general rules, casualty loss deduction and timber salvage sales are two separate events. This is from Dr. Uh, uh, Tamara Cushing, who's now at uh, University of Florida. She's a, a, an extension professor down there, very good tax uh, professional. And well, I shouldn't say tax professional, tax educator. And she has poured through the, 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 the tax code and talked with the IRS. There, there's a lot of documents out there. If you type in casualty, lost timber, extension articles will pop up all over the place. I've since changed one for Mississippi State, so it should be adjusted, re, uh, pretty, coming up pretty quickly. Uh, in the past, people believed that in order to declare the casualty, you had to make a good faith effort and, and, and salvage sell the timber, right? Make an effort to get rid of those trees, get them off, off, of the, off the land and sell them. That's not the case. So that's good for you as a landowner because now, uh, you know, a lot of times these salvages, we'll talk about those in a later, a later episode, but a lot of times salvage you either can't get anything done or the damage is so bad, there's really nothing merchandisable uh, for the loggers and um, you, there's really nothing you can do with the trees except let them sit there and then over time as they degrade, right, you burn, you windrow, do some other uh, uh, actions to kind of manage those fires that you're going to burn to try to try to get that, that biomass material off of the property as you're replanting and, and going forward so that they're not a fuel hazard. Sure. Let's see. Definitely falls into the realm of what I what I already called you voodoo. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, stack, I stack the tax voodoo on the economics voodoo, and by that point, nobody knows what I'm talking yeah, about. I, they just think I know what I'm, I'm doing. It, an important thing for you to remember when you're trying to determine the fair market value loss before and after, and according to the IRS, you have to look at what's called the single identifiable property. Okay, what is that? Well, it's a flexible term. So timber casualty loss shall be determined by reference to single identifiable property damaged or destroyed. And typically you'll hear the term, uh, you can use the block that's used to keep track of your timber basis, right? Remember we talked about as you cut trees, right? You take some of your basis off and as you plant trees, you, you could add basis back if you don't, you know, deduct it all with reforestation credit, which I, I recommend. Um, but wherever you're keeping track of that basis on your form T, uh, your timber form, um, that could be identified as your single identifiable property. And that's what they call a block. Uh, an alternative could be an operational unit, a logging unit, uh, anything established by geographical or political boundaries. The, the gold standard is what's called the qualified timber property or QTP. Now, there's reasons why you would want to use one or the other Qualified timber property is, is, is nice because as you're doing uh, reforestation, you get the 10,000, you know, immediately and then the amortized amount, uh, you know, for the rest going over eight years. That's tied to your QTP. And so a lot of people will manage based on that QTP because those reforestation uh, uh, tax incentives are so powerful in terms of keeping your your return on the overall property over the life of the stand really good, but you don't have to. Okay, it's it's flexible. QTP is typically going to be the largest of those, um, but again, you don't have to use that. But the IRS is is going to be the most comfortable with that. If you use the others, the timber basis is fine. You've got your form T. You're tracking that. The operational units can get a little more tricky because you you're going to need a forester to help show, hey, this is why these trees are, are, are being valued together and we're excluding others or we're including others along with it. Okay, so I mentioned uh, the lesser of these two, so the, the decrease in the fair market value or the adjusted timber uh, basis in, in, that, in that block that you're gonna decide on. 
um, it's not just the proportion of the trees that were actually damaged. So you can't say, well, hey, I had 50 acres of 25-year-old trees knocked down, and those trees sell for you know $20 a ton, and there's my loss. Um, that's what we would prefer, and, and there's some some advocacy groups trying to push more for that because in comparison to ag and some of these other things, we don't we don't have those uh, those nice insurances and, and, and payments to help out with losses. Another important issue is what we call retroactive basis. Let's say you had a stand that gets hit and you're trying to determine whether, you know, which of the two is lower, your basis or the fair market value difference. Sure. But you never figured out what your basis was. And a lot of people don't. You should ultimately do it whenever you acquire the property. Either you buy it or you inherit it or it's gifted to you. And so what you have to do is if you if this event happens to you and you're not ready to sell, you're going to have to do what's called a retroactive basis where you essentially have to get somebody in after a storm is hit, so it's already dodgy enough, to also run that stand backward in time and hoping, you know, you also have to account for thinnings if they'd occurred to see what the, you know, the basis is in that stand. And I've actually helped with a little bit of that. Yeah. See, even I've been involved with a little bit of what you're talking about there. And retroactive cruising is not easy. It's it, it, it's some of the most not important. Not fun. <laughs> yeah, it's some of the most important work, and it's the hardest to do. Yeah. Um, I've never done it, anything on, on paper, or except on paper. But, uh, yeah, uh, that's that's tough work. Yeah, boring and growth rings and, yeah, oh, yeah, buckets of fun. Well, if it's long enough, then you got to get out the growth and yield simulators, yeah. too. I've and, never done that, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I, I'd probably be more comfortable with that, to be honest. But um, so we've got, talked about what's deductible. Well, obviously, if your timber is held for an investment or business. So again, are you, is your, from our management objectives uh, 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 episode, is your primary reason for owning the timber uh, for profit motivation? If it is, then this is deductible for you. What if you hold it for personal use or hobby? Well, in that case, it's limited to these presidentially declared disaster areas only. So if there's a casualty and the president doesn't get involved uh, and you're a hobbyist or a personal, you know, personal trees in your yard, you're out of luck. If, if it is declared, you also then have to reduce whatever your loss is uh, by 10% of your adjusted gross income, your AGI, and then subtract $100. I don't know where they came up with that $100. <laughs> it's almost like just one more kick while you're, while you're down, right? They really, they really don't want to help out people who are growing these trees for, for non-income producing reasons. So you're going to claim this uh, uh, casualty in the year that it occurs for the, the federally declared disasters. You can take the deduction on an amended tax return from the previous year. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility to, you know, put that, you know, put, put it where it's going to make the most difference on your tax bill. Um, if you're reporting that loss, Everybody's going to go to originally to the, the form 4684, which is, is a, the a, a losses form. And then your business owners are going to go to form 4797. If you're an investor, and this is why I'm reading these off, this is important. If you're an investor, you got to go to the 1040 Schedule A. Well, Schedule A is itemized deductions. Well, what do I have to give up if I do itemized deductions? My standard deduction. Yep. And so here's where businesses are much more advantageous to the investor. If the business owner can still take their standard deduction and report these losses, so they, yeah. can, they can still get both. If you're the investor, now you have the added complication of having to go, well, which one's going to be bigger now? After I've done all these other calculations, would I just be better off getting my standard deduction? Um, so it's, again, back, back to what I said at the beginning, there's nothing good here, right? These are... We're trying right, to turn right. the, the worst. Yeah, but those, the, all those calculations give you guys, you know, a job. I mean, that, that that's the purpose of it, right? Uh, no comment. Uh, no landowner wants to hear that from me. Um, and, and for personal use, same thing. Uh, if it is a presidentially declared disaster, you go to that 1040, go to the Schedule A, and there's actually a, a casualty event line, and you, so you'd go to line 15. Insurance. If you expect to be reimbursed for part or all of the loss, you have to subtract the expected reimbursement when you calculate the loss. You must reduce your loss even if you don't receive payment until later 
uh, until a later tax year, which is another further complication. You're having to guesstimate. Um, and then if that happens, if you're over or under, guess what? Now you got to go on to the next tax return and do an amendment to it. So it's a multiple year after you've been kicked in the teeth. It's this multiple year process of yeah. dealing with this paperwork, which is just it's it's really tough on people. Again, I mentioned they're separate events. Okay to claim the loss, deal with the salvage later. I will say if you're going to do salvage, you need to call the night of the storm or before. Uh, you wait a week, you're you're probably not going to find anybody if you're small. No, it, it flood, it, the, the market floods really fast. Um, yes, yeah, so I already said that. What if there's a gain? After all this stuff, <laughs> you actually run a salvage sale, uh, you know, to get the trees off the ground, and there'd be good reasons to in many cases. If you receive income, in this case, we're going to, they call it, the, from the IRS's perspective, they call it involuntary conversion. So if your salvage income is greater than that adjusted timber basis that you have, that you've calculated, then you have a gain. Now, that's a, usually a bad thing because you weren't ready to cut those trees that year. Otherwise, they'd already been cut, right? Or they'd be in the process of being cut. So it's probably in a year you don't want to uh, uh, get a, a, a slug of income, but so be it, right? So you got one of two things you can do. Pay the tax on the gain in the year that it occurred, or you can defer the gain by purchasing qualified replacement property. What is qualified replacement property? Reforestation expenses, replacement timberland, reforestation on replacement property, and here's my favorite, controlling stock in a timber corporation. Um, not, a lot of, not a lot of us uh, ha have that option, but uh, I, I would caution you on doing reforestation expenses. Um, again, there's no reforestation uh, uh, tax benefits in the deductions if you use this money to then reforest the same stand. Um, so you're, this is also hitting you again in terms of, it's also hitting you again in terms of uh, not getting that most preferential tax treatment in terms of reforestation uh, deductions that you normally would get if you had just cut in a regular situation. You have two years from the time the event occurs, even if that bleeds over into an additional tax year, uh, you have two years from the time it happens, <laughs> not two years, you know, from uh, this year's tax uh, 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 when you when you submitted your taxes. Okay, last thing here: treatment of expenses. So, whenever you have a casualty loss, if you're going to bring a, a forester out there to do some work for you, do appraisal, or maybe not an appraisal, but certainly a cruise photos, incidental costs, things like that, you can add them to the part of your casualty loss calculation. So remember that FMV before and FMV after, you can't add this in because then, right, the logic would be you're going to, you could blow that number up as much as you want. Landowners holding timber as an investment capitalize uh, these expenses, right? So they would go back into your, your timber account, which you could then subtract in a future sale. Landowners holding timber for a use or a trade or business, you can deduct them and you use your 1040 Schedule C or F. F if you also have some farming operations. C if you're just purely a, a timber landowner. One last thing, and then we'll, 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 we'll chop things off for now. Um, there are disaster payments available in, in many cases. This is typically through Farm Service Agency that I've seen. And so, like, when I first started uh, Mississippi State, well, about six months later, not only did COVID hit, but we had a big, big, uh, bad run of tornadoes that came through and really devastated uh, southwest Mississippi. There's one for Christmas tree growers right now from the freeze we had back in December. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, but you would go to uh, the Casualties and Thefts, Form 4684, and there's a line right above uh, the, the number one there. And it says, uh, check here and enter the FEMA disaster declaration number. And then you, you go to the FEMA website and it will tell you if the recent storm, if your county is included in that. And if it is, then you can reach out to FSA and you actually can get some money for dealing with cleanup, for reforestation, things like that. Um, 
Qualified disaster payments are excludable from your income as well. And that's really important. So you're not having to do the Faustian bargain where I'm going to get this money from the government in order to kind of get back to square one, uh, but I've got to add it to my income and thus, you know, my, my tax uh, burden is going to be a lot higher. These don't count as income. However, there's no resulting increase in basis or adjusted basis for which the payments are made. So you don't get to double dip there. And, uh, you know, lastly, the exclusion does not apply to amounts received for the sale or disposition uh, uh, of the property. Um, and so, again, if you're trying to game the system, they're, they're going to make sure that they understand, you know, which, what's happened with sales and things like that uh, around these events. I think that's uh, everything I have for now. It's kind of a, a quick rush through uh, of casualty. But again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email us at uh, timberuniversity at gmail.com. And uh, Brady, did you have any last thing you wanted to add? No, I'm good. We're, uh, like I said, we're into that realm of your, your mumbo jumbo stuff. <laughs> I, can't, I can't add anything there, man. Well, it's good, it's good to have some uh, value added on my end as well then. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, and uh, we appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks. The Timber University podcast has been brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Forestry and the University of Arkansas at Monticello's Forest Business Center. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us at timberuniversity, all one word, at gmail.com.